Hi, I'm Pete Weiner. I'm a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. I'm a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and a contributing editor uh, at the Atlantic. Uh, and I've uh, worked in three uh, previous Republican administrations, the George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan administrations and the George W. Bush, Bush White House. Uh, and today I am um, happy to be the moderator of a panel a discussion, a moment of truth combating extremism and nativism. Uh, and I'm even more thrilled uh, to host uh, two people, uh, David French and Elizabeth Newman. So I'll quickly introduce them and, and then we'll get to the, uh, to the conversation. David is a uh, senior editor for The Dispatch. He's a columnist for Time. He's a best-selling New York Times um, author. Uh, his most recent book is Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our uh, Nation. Uh, he is a graduate of Harvard Law School a former major in the uh, United States Army Reserve. He was deployed uh, to Iraq in uh, 2007 and awarded the Bronze Star. And he now resides in Franklin, uh, Tennessee. Elizabeth Newman uh, is the Chief Strategy Officer for Moonshot, which is a social enterprise working uh, to end uh, online harms, uh, violent extremism, disinformation, uh, child sexual exploitation, gender-based violence, and human trafficking. She served as the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And in that post, she advocated for the government uh, to better address domestic violent extremism, which is one of the topics that we'll, we'll be talking about. She also serves on the board of the National Immigration Forum, and she lives in uh, Northern uh, Virginia. So it's great to have uh, both of you um, with, uh, with us today. Uh, thanks for carving out the, uh, the time. Um, I think I want to start broad uh, in terms of some, some of the topics, and then maybe we'll, we'll narrow in on, on some of them. And, and David, I'll begin with, with you, and then we'll go to Elizabeth with, with, with a different question. But for you, David, both of you have, have spoken and written about the rise of um, Christian nationalism and right-wing extremism. What's your sense of where things stand today, uh, and what's led to our current divisions and the consequences uh, if our uh, rhetoric continues to be uh, more and more supercharged um, and uh, and filled with with rancor and antipathy, yeah, I didn't think I would say this, but um, I'm more alarmed right now about where we are uh, on Christian nationalism and right wing extremism more broadly than I was the evening of January sixth. Um, part of me thought uh, as we were watching those terrible images on the screen on the 6th, that this was going to be a shock, and it would shock us back to a sort of a, a, a longing for a better and more decent political engagement. But very quickly after that, and especially in parts of the far right, January 6th created, began to create a new narrative of persecution, a new narrative of grievance. And that new narrative of persecution and new narrative of grievance can basically summed up as the political prisoner narrative. And so what's essentially happening is there's this conviction that the left has more broadly seized on January 6th as a pretext for a crackdown. And that many of these protesters who stormed the Capitol were in fact quite normal everyday folks who were just wrong place, wrong time. And that the crackdown on January 6th is part of an overall crackdown on dissent and the overall slide uh, from of the United States into tyranny. And so what you're beginning to see happen is that that narrative is taking hold. Again, not, not with everybody. The, the conservative world, the, the Republican world is pretty broadly divided right now between those who kind of long for something more normal and, and stable and between those who are being ever more radicalized. And so we have to acknowledge the division. We have to acknowledge that huge numbers of Republicans don't like to see sort of the rise of this radicalism on the right, but they don't know what to do about it. But there is still the rise of radicalism on the right. And one, one last quick thing on this. One of the ways you're seeing this is in the, uh, in the school board debate, in the school board um, uh, meetings and the school board disruptions. Now, it is absolutely the case that there are some school boards, particularly on the left, that might be cracking down on rowdy people exercising their First Amendment rights, but it is also true that there is an escalate envi escalating environment of threats directed at school board members. This is something that's actually happening. People showing up at school board 
members' homes, outside their homes, people carrying weapons outside school board members' homes, threats by email, threats by mail, threats in person. And that this is, an, this is yet another part of this progression. And that kind of personal harassment is inherently dangerous. And I'm increasingly worried that people are going to be hurt. Thank you. Um, it's a sobering assessment, but it seems to me a, a, an accurate one. And, uh, and we need to know the truth uh, and reality of things in, in order to, uh, to deal with them. Um, Elizabeth, let me go to you. Uh, in 2020, um, the, the Trump administration's uh, Department of Homeland Security rated homegrown and domestic uh, violent extremism as the primary um, terrorist threat to the United States. And in a way that presaged what happened on January um, 6. I'm picking up on, on what David said. I'd be interested, we're now nine months removed from January 6. Um, how do you think about that in terms of the, the, the significance of that moment, what it meant, uh, and then how do we combat the, the threat? Uh, and what role does language and rhetoric uh, that we use play uh, in, in inciting uh, violence? Everything David said, I agree with. I think the situation we have today is extremely more complex than it was pre-January 6th. Um, but let's start with where we were maybe before January 6th. We had um, uh, stats come out last month that hate crimes in 2020 were up 14% over 2019. 2019 was already a, um, a high watermark year. Uh, we have uh, the Center um, uh, for Strategic, uh, CSIS, blanking on how to say it, their full name, CSIS um, studies domestic terrorism attacks and plots uh, going back to 1994. 20, uh, 2020 was the highest year that they've had um, on record in their assessment. Uh, there was a 69% increase over 2019. Now, not as many fatalities as we had in 2019, but that's in large part because we were all quarantined in 2020. Um, so significant number of increasing uh, hate crimes, domestic terrorism attacks, plots, arrests, any way you look at it, um, it it's just not a good picture. Um, something else that I, just a fascinating phenomenon, the work that I do with Moonshot, they, uh, they focus on the online environment. And Moonshot documented 140% increase in engagement with domestic violent extremist content over um, in 2020 sorry, in 2021 over 2019. So in about a period of, of one to two years, we've seen that um, doubling, double, almost uh, one and a half times the amount of engagement with uh, white supremacist and anti-government extremist content. So there is there is something driving us as a, as a society towards these um, increases in um, violent uh, ideology and, and violent acts itself. I, I think there's no way to look at this time period, though it's really hard when we're in the moment. Um, but I, I think we will look back and recognize that the pandemic um, impact here is pretty significant, that you take the pandemic out of it. And even though we had a really um, intense election period, I, I don't know if we would have seen as deep um, and as wide of an amplified ex expansion of this violent extremism um, uh, context. So, so that's, that's where we were in 2020. You get to January 6th, and for uh, security experts, the, 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 co the context becomes a lot more complicated because for, for at least a decade, probably longer, we had been seeing violent extremist groups attempt to co-opt conservative narratives. They have been, it's called mainstreaming. They're trying to take their ideology and move it into the mainstream. Um, by doing that, it allows them to engage in polite conversation with otherwise what they call normies, people with normal lives, people that um, you know, go care about, you know, getting their kids to school, they work hard, they don't, you know, they're maybe politically active, but they're not, they don't have time to go, uh, and nor would they ever, if you confronted them and say, hey, do you want to join a white supremacist group? They would never in a million years think that. But by co-opting some of these narratives, um, they all of a sudden find themselves adjacent to uh, normal people and the extremist people. And that's what we saw on January 6th. We physically saw neo-Nazi signs and Christian flags and MAGA signs all in one location. You saw a gallows 
built um, on the you know capital grounds right alongside where people were um, doing prayers through a bullhorn. This this um, amalgamation of people there for different purposes creates an environment where um, it becomes very difficult as a security professional to figure out who's actually the one I should be concerned about. Um, and just a, a few stats that, that kind of show where we are today. In um, the summer, the University of Chicago uh, did a study uh, or did a poll as part of their, their work on January 6th and found 21 million Americans believe that the election is stolen and that violence is justified in order to return Trump to the presidency. Before January 6th, the best estimate we had, because we don't keep good data in the United States. Best estimate we had for number of people involved in white supremacist to, that content or activity that potentially has a violent nexus, about 100,000. So to go to 21 million potential, now not everybody's going to go do something tomorrow, but the potential scope here is it, it's massive. It's not something that we have the security forces. There are 800,000 sworn law enforcement officers in, in the United States. We don't have the security capability to deal with 21 million potentially violent people. So it, it begs the question, I mean, it, clearly the, 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 the grievances, the undercurrent that, that drove this um, are much bigger than just a, a white supremacist or anti-government extremist narrative, but they have successfully stirred up um, mainstream Americans, conservative, Republican, uh, white evangelicals, um, and some small percentage, but still large number when you consider a country of 300 plus million people are willing to potentially commit acts of violence. So it's a very difficult situation um, to, to figure out how to solve from a security standpoint. I think we have to look at other civil society tools to address this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Again, that's sobering, but, but it strikes me as accurate. I, I, I wonder, in, in, in some respects, I guess my, my concern, my fear is that people who are dedicated to political violence commit acts of political violence, and then that sort of breaks through, and then you get, uh, it, in, it begins to infect the rest of the public, and it catalyzes a whole series of, of very dangerous uh, responses. Um, so um, that's something, obviously, we have to be alert, alert to. Uh, let me move now to, to uh, telescope it a little bit on the issue of, of immigration. Uh, and David, I'll, I'll start with you, which is, how's the increased polarization and extremist rhetoric impacted America's, uh, Americans' attitudes toward immigrants and immigration? And maybe just take a half step back, which is why, um, in, in your estimation, has immigration become, over the last half decade, if not the main issue in the culture war, certainly one of the main issues in, in, in the culture war. It's the language of the other. We're hearing increasingly language of white replacement theory from Tucker Carlson, who's, I would say, the most important media figure on the American right. Um, so uh, the, what's your sense of, of, of that, the impact on, on immigrants and immigration and what's going on? And then, Elizabeth, I'll ask you the same question. Well, you know, I think what began in some ways, especially in more intellectual circles, as a prudential policy argument has turned into a partisan identity marker. And so here's what I mean about prudential policy argument. There are legitimate arguments to be had about what level of immigration you should have, legal immigration you should have into the United States of America. There are le legitimate policy arguments based on who should be, what should be the priorities of an of, uh, a, an immigration regime? Are you looking for more high-skilled immigrants? Are you looking for, you know, sort of the, the, the keeping together family unit? There's a lot of ways to look at this. This is a, this is a, uh, a, a complex policy issue. Okay, so let's acknowledge that. And then, but the other thing is, however, I believe that what's ended up happening is that the, the, that policy is, issue has been swamped by the, a partisan issue, and the partisan issue is becoming increasingly tainted by a racial issue. And so the partisan issue has been, well, the Democrats just want to bring in a bunch of future constituents, right? That they're, they want to swamp the American borders, overwhelm the American political system with people who are essentially going to be, and this is the term of the replacement theory, the great replacement theory, that you're replacing an electorate. You have 
white voters with declining birth rates. You bring in a whole bunch of Latino voters. Bingo, presto. You not only uh, remake American culture, you remake American politics, and this is sort of the democratic plan. This is something you hear, for example, most prominently in Tucker Carlson. And so the argument over that then tends to swamp the policy argument. What, what, what is a rational immigration policy? And so it, then it becomes a matter of uh, negative polarization so that if you are in, wearing the red jersey, then it is almost obligatory to be a, an immigration restrictionist. There was some interesting polling by Ryan Burge and analyses of polling by Ryan Burge, who's a statistician for Eastern Illinois. And he said, for self-described evangelicals, immigration restrictionism is now a more important issue than abortion. It is more salient to their vote than abortion. And that if you break out various American religious segments, American evangelicals are the most restrictionist and part of this is because American evangelicals are also the most partisan of American religious subgroups, because what did I say earlier? This has become a matter of partisan politics. And so what's ending up happening is that the policy argument is being lost. For a long time, there has been sort of laying out there a sort of a broad immigration compromise that a lot of people, if you divorce it from partisan politics, support, and that is more in more security at the border at this in exchange for for example path to citizenship or permanent residence for people you know in particular dreamers and also perhaps for people who've been here peacefully and working for a long period of time there's sort of long been that kind of thing hanging out there but because it's so completely caught up in partisan politics it's become extremely toxic and then what becomes racialized about this or what was racialized for some people from the beginning is because immigration is now so completely seen as a South American immigration issue, then all of a sudden, then immigration becomes an issue about a particular subset of people, as a particular racial category of people, and that that is then seen as the threat. And so that you just go step by step by step by step into sort of outright hostility and emerging xenophobia. And I, I think it's important to emphasize how much that contradicts the spirit and ethos of the conservative movement if you look at a broader sweep of time. Because I grew up, uh, I grew up during the Cold War. And Pete, you're old enough to remember growing up in the Cold War. I think I'm a little older than you, but you're old enough to remember the Cold War. And one of the things about that period of time is that conservatives and Republicans were incredibly proud of the fact that this was the place where everyone wanted to move to. The Soviet Union was the place that everyone wanted to leave. We were the place where everyone wanted to, we, we were the magnet, they were the repellent. And, and Ronald Reagan did an amnesty in 1986, if I remember my dates correctly. There was a tremendous amount of pride that this is the place where people wanted to come. And there was also this tremendous amount of sort of uh, satisfaction in, in that this was the place and also a pride that this was a place that welcomed refugees. This was the place that if you were fleeing oppression, this is where you were. And, and the change in that mindset has been remarkable. And a lot of people now say, well, that's part of conservatism. And I'm thinking, no, 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 I have a memory. <laughs> I remember a totally different mindset. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, that you don't have then debates over how many people should come in and what skill sets, et cetera. But what is your mindset? What is, what is your basic posture? Is your basic posture one of welcoming? Is your basic posture one of believing that we should in fact be a haven for people who are oppressed? Is your basic posture one that says, we believe that immigrants contribute to our economic and cultural vitality rather than um, inhibiting our economic and cultural vitality? If that, that should be your basic posture from which you approach these arguments. And so that's a switch. That's a switch. And I think it's a, it's a negative switch and it's not an inherently conservative switch. Yeah, before going to you, Elizabeth, so I want you to dilate a little bit on, on that question too and anything that David said, but I'll take the prerogative of a moderator um, and just mention 
David, what you said, which is people now saying this is a conservative position. I think one of the frustrations that I have is what's happening now, it's unfolding in national politics, the Republican Party is not conservatism, it's populism, it's ethnic nationalism. In many ways, what's happening now, um, what goes under the banner of conservatism uh, is actually completely antithetical uh, to, to conservatism, including the passions uh, and mob mentality, um, but, but, a, but a lot more. So uh, one of the things I think is important is actually to rescue conservatism uh, from, uh, from MAGA world, uh, because whatever that is, it's not conservatism in, in uh, at least as, as, I, uh, as I understand it. But Elizabeth, back to the, the issue of uh, immigration, um, wh what are your thoughts about both the, the extremist rhetoric, the attitudes toward immigration, um, and if you wanna add uh, to anything that David said. I, you're, you're absolutely right that this is um, not, what conservatism was about. Um, there, clearly, you can look back in our history, there have been dark periods where we have passed laws that were bigoted and racist, um, but, but we have also uh, pushed back against that as a society. And we're, we're moving towards um, a place of, of recognizing the benefit of, of being a welcoming nation, um, of, of trying to aspire and, and reach the, the values, the virtues that we founded, that the country was founded on. Um, so the last, you know, six, seven, eight years uh, are rather shocking um, to, to have watched a, a party shift so dramatically and um, in its value system. Uh, and it's, and it's almost hard to, um, especially if you're not, if you don't, you know, if your business is not in government or, or um, paying attention to politics, it's really hard to understand what's going on. I've spent time since leaving government trying to understand uh, what happened. Um, when I went back to the Department of Homeland Security in 2017, uh, we were tasked with implementing a whole number of security, supposedly security-based enhancements to our immigration system. Um, and when I became the assistant secretary in 2018, uh, my team was responsible for uh, in implementing some of those enhancements uh, pertaining to refugees and asylees and um, the overseeing the travel, what was known as the Muslim travel ban, um, actually travel restrictions. But the, um, you know, getting into the weeds, when my background was counterterrorism, it wasn't immigration policy, but getting into the weeds and understanding um, the, the enhancements that had been made, quite frankly, 10 years ago, um, around the time that I had left government, uh, you, you all might remember, um, there was a, a bombing, or an attempted bombing on Christmas Day, um, the, the so-called underwear bomber. And there were a whole bunch of reforms that happened after that. Um, to enhance our screening and vetting capabilities for anybody coming into the country. But we had a number of attacks uh, in 2015 and 2016, uh, the rise of ISIS. So by the time you get to 2016 and the campaign is going on, it's a very relevant conversation. How safe are we? Do we need to be making more changes? So when I come into government in 2017, having been out for six years, you're, you're kind of catching up, you know, what, what has been done? Are we doing as much as we need to do? I came away from that, that experience thinking we have done some significant work. Like I arguably uh, uh, got David French, the civil uh, liberties um, uh, protector here. Uh, you know, are, there are probably some things that we probably need to go back and, and do better in terms of making sure we're not infringing on civil liberties. Um, but I have, I'm very confident that the security measures we have in place would detect a known or suspected terrorist and would, and we, we have a very strong layered defense system to be able to see people trying to get to us well before they come to our shores. So um, somewhere around, I, I would say 2019, we had done this work, we'd actually made some improvements. There's still room to go, it's the government. It always takes too long to make government work well. Um, but, you know, you're feeling like, hey, you know, we've, we've done some good here, some, and we're building on what had been happening in, during the Obama administration. Um, I feel very confident, uh, I was briefing the secretary, I feel very confident telling you that our refugee screening and vetting system is secure, that 
Um, what we're doing with travel restrictions, though I didn't personally agree with some of the tools they use, but we, we were making um, some security enhancements that were good. Um, okay, great. So we can raise the refugee ceiling, right? In 2019, the refugee ceiling went lower. And then in 2020, because of the pandemic, they just kind of canceled the whole program and it's still recovering from that. And it, it was this, I should have seen it sooner. Um, I was so focused on the security mission that I, I, I wasn't seeing the big picture, but it was that, it was that moment where you're like, oh, this had nothing to do with security. This had everything to do with, they just want less immigrants coming into the country. And if the argument had been, as David's pointing out, here are the logical reasons why we don't want more immigrants into our country. Um, that, that's something you could uh, talk about. In, in the public and explain why it's best for the United States to have less refugees, why it's best for the, uh, the United States to have less immigrants. But that's not what they were doing. They were using a, a cloak of security justification for the reason to reduce the amount of immigration. And when you look underneath the hood, it, there's no security justification there. And, and I came to the realization that this was this for, for a small portion, not, not everybody that served, but for a small portion um, uh, of folks really close to the president, this was a, a, a nativist view um, of we just want white people here in the country. Like it was okay to bring people uh, from Europe into the country. It was not okay to have Haitians or to have people from Africa. So there was, a, there was clearly a racist tent there and they knew that they couldn't lead with that. So they used security instead. I wish that we could convey to the American people that what they are seeing in terms of these arguments about um, why, why we can't have refugees coming or you know, all of those people in the southern border, I wish they would understand that this has been orchestrated, that there have been people planning for 10 or 20 years, building these false arguments um, to eventually get to this space where they have basically co-opted a, a, a major political party um, and turned them into uh, populist nativists um, to hopefully try to stave off, I think, for, I don't think everybody believes this, but but there's a small core there that's trying, that truly believes in a great replacement theory and is trying to establish uh, the whiteness of America. It's very disgusting. It's evil. And it needs to be exposed in order for us to get back to having rational policy uh, debates, which are legitimate um, and uh, and deserve to be um, you know held. But the the undercurrent here is is very evil, and and it deserves to be um, exposed. And I, until you until we kind of grapple with that, like I, I don't know that um, we can make much progress because of of, of the. Uh, um, orchestration and the the uh, cloak of darkness that some of these figures are operating under. Thank you. We've only got uh, two minutes left, so it's not nearly enough. But David, let me just uh, pose one last question. Uh, maybe you can you can uh, expand on it a little bit or or offer some thoughts on it. Which is, all three of us are people of the Christian faith, and and I wonder in the context of immigration, um, how uh, how you understand it proper biblical ethic as it relates to immigration. Again, not specific necessarily to policy, but what should be the disposition or the sensibility that you would draw from, um, from, uh, from the Bible that ought to inform uh, people of the Christian faith on this topic? Yeah, I, I think what you're talking about is a, is a, a general, what is, your, what is your basic posture? What is sort of the basic principle under which you're operating from? And that is in this circumstance, you're welcoming the stranger. You are providing a haven and a home for the refugee. Now, does that mean that there aren't prudential concerns that come in if you have, for example, known national security threats, or if you have um, you have strains on 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 social infrastructure? I mean, these are things that are prudential concerns that can mean at any given moment you have to be more cautious, but the basic posture, the basic emphasis, I believe still must be on uh, when people are fleeing oppression, when people are fleeing privation and seeking opportunity, the basic posture is one of welcome. And this is something that America has gone back and forth on. As Elizabeth has, has noted, um, few societies have 
been more welcoming than ours over the long course of our history. And we've also gone through periods of extreme backlash. But if you look at the overall arc of what immigration has done for this country, it's been overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly positive. And, and so I think that when you're talking about as a matter of faith, as a matter of sort of um, uh, morality, faith informed morality, it's that posture of welcome, it's that posture of hospitality. And then when you're, and that's the, the basic default. And then there are sometimes prudential concerns that can say less maybe now than more, but that doesn't contradict the fundamental posture. Great, it's really well said. Thank you uh, very much. And thanks to both of you, David and Elizabeth, uh, for, for um, offering your thoughts and your, on your wisdom on this, uh, on this topic. I appreciate you being with us. Well, thanks so much, Pete. Thank you.